Joining me now is best-selling author Douglas Murray. Douglas, the Democratic National Convention is underway and we are told the Democrats are all about joy, but inside and outside the venue it appears that the modern left is devoid of joy. There are violent protests from a range of activists outside in Chicago and inside the convention we've had plenty of vitriol, including President Biden's manic rant where he repeated many debunk lies like this. When the president was asked what he thought had happened, Donald Trump said, and I quote, there are very fine people on both sides. My God. That's what he said. That is what he said and what he meant. That's what I realized. I had to listen to the admonition of my dead son. I could not stay in the sidelines. So I ran. Douglas, even Snopes has debunked this fake news, but President Biden persists with this inflammatory lie even after an assassination attempt almost so uh, President Trump shot dead. Why do the Democrats persist with, with this lie? Why are they so tied to this narrative? Absolutely. It's just one of a set of completely debunkable lies that just should have no place in politics. Mm. If people want to stop lying in politics, they should start by just not lying themselves. Um, Joe Biden has been using this uh, this complete misquotation from what former President Trump said after the Charlottesville uh, um, appalling scenes there in 2017. He, uh, he has kept using this claim that Donald Trump simply said fine people on both sides as opposed to some of the people trying to defend statues in the area were fine mm. people. But Trump went on to say that there was no excuse for the neo-Nazis, white supremacists and so on who were on show that day. Um, Joe Biden has had plenty of opportunity to correct himself but he just doesn't. Mm. He's determined to stick to the narrative. And if you look at that very strange performance of his last night, it's a complete replica of performances he's done before. He talks about Charlottesville. He claims that Donald Trump praised the neo-Nazis. He then cites his, his uh, late son, Beau. And it's as if Biden knows this will fire himself up and he hopes will fire his supporters up. Uh, it's the same thing with the Democrats trying to claim that former President Trump referred to a bloodbath coming if he comes back, as opposed to a bloodbath for the automobile industry if Kamala Harris were to get in. But, you know, as I say, if people actually care about lying in politics, just don't lie. And these are just straight out, completely verifiable lies that Biden is telling about the person who was his opponent. And I think it's just appalling. And if Trump was doing this, people would call it out. I see no reason why they shouldn't do it if Biden is. Especially if it had been an assassination attempt against President Biden yeah. uh, and you still put forward these really ugly, inflammatory lies. Well, now, President Biden was also angry about the... Uh, Israel Hamas war. He wants a permanent ceasefire and he thinks that the anti Israeli protesters outside the venue have a point. Uh, Biden, um, let's have a listen to what he said about these protests. And finally, finally, finally deliver a ceasefire and end this war. Those, trust, those protesters out in the street, they have a point. Douglas, your reaction to that and uh, looking forward, what sort of uh, foreign policy can we expect from a Harris-Walls administration? Uh, Kamala has also made it clear she does not see this war uh, through a binary lens, to use her words. Uh, well, I mean, again, such a bizarre performance by Biden. I mean, so angry, so so sort of filled mm. with fury, which I just can't help thinking looks completely put on, I have to say. It just looks completely staged and fake to me, uh, that performance, as if he's trying to show there's 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 a life in the older guy yet. Um, but, yeah, he whipped himself up to that. And then that very strange claim that people outside have a point. Well, well, yes, I mean, everybody wants the killing to stop. Everyone wants the war to stop. The, the, the follow-on question, the only important question is, on whose terms? Is it once... Hamas has been destroyed or surrendered and given back the remaining Israeli hostages? Or is it just 
stop now because everybody hates killing. Well, I have to say, I mean, I'm not sure how much Joe Biden is able to think this through anymore. Um, uh, but I'm not sure whether Kamala Harris has much of an ability to think it through either. I mean, the banalities that come from these people outside the DNC in Chicago this week, by the way, which include people flying Hamas flags and wearing Hezbollah uniforms, which, by the way, as prescribed terrorist organizations ought to be an offense in the United States. But let's park that for now. If he thinks they have a point, well, why doesn't he say to them uh, uh, that if you want to free Gaza, the best thing to do is to free Gaza from Hamas? Why doesn't he correct these people? Because what he has realized in the last year and what I think Kamala Harris, if she does become president, will realize very fast is these kinds of protesters uh, are not going to stop with a little bit of on the one side, on the other ism. They burn the American flag in the capital of D.C., uh, as well as the Israeli flag, these protesters. These are not some kind of, you know, simply want to cause a ceasefire and stop the killing sort of Dalai Lama mm. or, I don't know, Buddhist sort of, you know, pacifists. Far, far from it. Uh, you're so right there. Uh, they've shown us who they are over and over again, and some politicians, some in the media, refuse to see it. Now, on the issue of the economy, and it's probably the number one issue in America, along with the illegal immigration crisis, you've written in the New York Post about the choice Americans face in November. And when it comes to economic policies, you argue the choice is between those who will grow the size of the economy and those who will grow the size of the state. Uh, Kamala Harris is arguing strongly that Americans should continue to march forward. Is that how you see it? <laughs> yes, of course, because in the same way that Joe Biden sees uh, um, all things as being either um, him or the Nazis, uh, um, in the case yeah. of Kamala Harris, of course, she, her great insight into politics is that we should go forwards, not backwards. And actually, uh, as I mentioned in that piece in the New York Post, uh, when it comes to the economy, going backwards a bit wouldn't be such a bad thing. Uh, the economy between mm. uh, 2016 and 2020 uh, did far better, and that's until the COVID uh, um, disaster, uh, did far better certainly than the Harris-Biden administration has managed economically in the four years since. And you simply need to look at any of the figures, whether it's median household income, uh, whether it's Things like the, the rise in median household income for black Americans, by the way, uh, which was better under Trump than under Obama, as well as much better than it has been under Trump-Harris. If you look at just things like inflation, which is, you know, causing just devastation to Americans paying their bills each month, or you go to something like the attainability of getting on the household ladder, uh, First-time home, home ownership is, is tougher now than it's been in America at any point since 1984. And uh, so when Kamala Harris says, you know, we need to go forwards into this great world, which, by the way, I've been the second most important person in for the last four years, but give me a chance for another four years because that's where it'll really improve. Um, I think people just need to look at the figures. The figures in the economy under, under, under Biden-Harris have been really pretty woeful. And uh, Harris should mm. certainly come up with a better plan than let's go forwards if she's going to persuade the electorate in November. Well, uh, given some of her economic policies uh, about price controls, I think the less she says, the better it will be for her because it's, uh, wow, she's a... Uh, quite radical in some of those positions. Yeah. Now, on a different issue, we've spoken uh, about the attacks against you personally, Elon Musk, from some very prominent voices in the UK who want you both arrested. Some are calling for you to be jailed. Uh, uh, our own ABC here in Australia is also a, a lover of censorship. It's a state-funded, uh, taxpayer-funded broadcaster. Their Media Watch program claims that the ex-owner, Elon Musk, is increasingly using his platform to spread misinformation and inflame social division. And they ask, can governments and regulators tame the erratic media mogul? Uh, is that 
really what's happening, Douglas? And is this a good use of our $1 billion plus dollars of taxpayer money that goes to the ABC every single year? Exactly. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, Rita? In Australia, uh, uh, in Canada, in Britain, it, all these countries, among others, have national broadcasters. And as you say, they're in receipt of huge amounts of public money. And uh, when I see those completely indentured broadcasters uh, attacking day after day Elon Musk as having too much power in the media, <laughs> sorry, guys, uh, you were the guys who were literally given a monopoly, uh, which has to be broken up by the free market. You're the guys who are still subsidized. Um, and you're the guys who can pump out disinformation all the time uh, under the guise of official, uh, the official sort of, you know, version of events and still ridiculously have some legitimacy for doing so. The reason why they're going for Elon Musk, among other things, is that he's beating them all uh, effectively in the ratings. Uh, 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 X Twitter, under his ownership, has become so much more respected and used as a news source than ABC and others, that of course they're concerned, of course they're worried. They should be, because it's perfectly possible that the it's not just evil Elon Musk that they've got to rail against. Actually, the problem for them is the audience. They are losing their audience mm. all the time. They keep their billion dollar subsidies. Oh, yeah. But they're losing audience all the time. And they're losing them, among other things, to Elon Musk. And so, of course, they're bitter. I don't think they're going to have much luck extraditing what? Elon Musk. And uh, the few people, uh, complete cranks uh, uh, um, in the UK who've been uh, uh, calling for some kind of censure of me, I've got a horrible surprise for them. They're not going to silence me either. You might as well give it up, guys. Yeah, well, the assault against uh, free speech in the UK, the, the two-tier policing, the two-tier justice mm -hmm. system there is something that is concerning people around the world. I do wonder if people in the UK realise that a lot of us around the world are looking on in horror. And at a time where in the UK violent Criminals, are, including killers, are having their jail times slashed because of overcrowding. They are prioritising locking up what they call far-right extremists. Let's hear here from Mark Fairhurst on the BBC. We will guarantee a prison cell. We will make sure that those people who need to be in prison will be in prison, not necessarily in the area where they live. They may be two, 300 miles away from home, but we will guarantee people a prison cell. Douglas, uh, you've written in The Spectator about the persecution of the plebs, as you've put it. Uh, explain what you mean by that and this uh, assault against free speech in the UK. And it, it really is, I think, quite effective because you're seeing people being arrested for online posts, for retweeting something, for attending a rally that was violent, even if they didn't participate in any of the violence. You can see why people are uh, uh, refraining from saying what they think. Yeah, uh, the point of this piece, and of course I use plebs in inverted commas, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, my point is, is that I suspect that uh, the authorities, if they try to go down this route, will have quite a hard time, as I say, taking out somebody like Elon Musk. Uh, and they'd have a hard mm. time taking out, in that case, I cited Rowan Atkinson, the great comedian who some years ago defended um, the, the, the speech laws in the UK against it, further uh, encroachment against the freedom of speech in Britain. Um, as Rowan Atkinson said then 10 years ago, he said, I don't think they're going to kind of come for me. But, but I think that the people who have less of a profile or no profile could be very vulnerable in this situation. I said what Rowan Atkinson saw 10 years or more ago is exactly what's happening now. Because actually what's happening is that as well as, by the way, the, the sudden discovery that our prisons have got masses of room in them, apparently, um, and the discovery by the police who can't solve a, a, a burglary in most areas in the UK and haven't for years, uh, their discovery that they can be a really crack hit squad when it comes to policing Twitter um, is an amazing discovery for them. And apart from anything else, it makes their lives a lot easier. It's quite difficult, it, not that difficult, but it's quite difficult to chase down career criminals who are uh, routinely burglaring 
uh, um, uh, villages and cities in the UK, relatively easy, uh, by contrast, just knock on somebody's door and say, uh, I see that you retweeted this thing and it's regarded as being hate, so come with me. Um, but it's it's not much mm. of a laugh for the people whose lives are destroyed. And here's the thing. There, there have been people in recent weeks in the UK who said terrible things online. Uh, uh, there were some people who definitely said racist things online. There are other people who retweeted things, including information in the wake of the Southport murders that turned out not to be true. But what an amazing direction the resources of the police are put in. Weeks after the Southport stabbings of the three girls uh, um, slaughtered at a Taylor Swift dance party, uh, we don't know almost anything about the uh, killer, the alleged killer, as I have to say, um, the court system will probably take a very long time uh, to bring him to justice. The media, by the way, doesn't seem to be particularly bothered about him or his identity or anything that might have inspired him to this act of terror. Um, they've just, that's all sort of fallen away. What they have managed to focus on is people retweeting things that turned out not to be true in the wake of that. Oh, and those people have had special courts set up for them and all night sittings and more, and the jail cells have been found for them. Well, how about speeding up justice when it comes to, for instance, slaughtering young girls at a Taylor Swift dance party? But you can lock up a tweeter in 24 hours. Great example of uh, um, a completely corrupted and politicised justice system right there. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you.